Hi, this is Pastor Scott Bright from Berkeley Hills Lutheran Church, coming to you with the sermon for the fifth Sunday of Easter. I'm going to read as our scripture reading the first lesson appointed for the day. Normally, during the course of the year, the first lesson is an Old Testament lesson. During the season of Easter, and we're nearing the end of that, the uh, first lesson is instead from the New Testament book of Acts, the history of the early church. So I'm going to read to you from Acts 17, a little bit of a geography lesson first. Uh, St. Paul is in Athens in Greece, and the Areopagus that is mentioned is a huge stony outcropping, like a hill, but big and lumpy, uh, and it is within spitting distance of the Acropolis, which is a major pagan temple complex. Today, both the Areopagus and the Acropolis are giant tourist draws. Then Paul stood in front of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with the inscription to an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, he who is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands as, he, as if he needed anything, since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. From one ancestor he made all nations to inhabit the whole earth, and he allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of the places where they would live, so that they would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find him, though indeed he is not far off from each of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said. We too are his offspring. Since we are God's offspring, we ought not to think that de deity is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of people. While God has overlooked the times of human ignorance, now he commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day on which he will give the world, he hath the world judged in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed, and of this he has given assurance to all by raising that man from the dead. When they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some of them scoffed. But others said, We'll hear you again about this. At that point, Paul left them. But some of them joined him and became believers, including Dionysius the Areopagite and a woman named Amaris and others with them. The Word of the Lord. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. You know, we're back to square one in a lot of ways. The church, life in the church, feels like we are back at square one. We had 1,600 years, 1,500 years, where Christianity sort of dominated the culture of all of Western Europe and then North America. You could just assume if you made a Bible reference that people would get it. You could say, oh, you're as slow as Moses, or you're like, you're like Abraham, or you have the patience of Job, and people would get those references for a long, long time. People got those references. That's really not true as much anymore. For the longest time, you could assume that on a Sunday morning, you were going to get up and go to church, because that's what you do. You weren't going to sleep in. There wasn't anything else scheduled. Nothing else was open. And you were going to go, and all your neighbors were going to go, and it's just the way it was going to be. That's not true anymore. For the longest time, we just assumed to be an American is to be Christian, which was never actually true. But we still did assume it. We acted as if that were the case. Now, there's not even any pretending that that is the case. We're back at square one. 
The lesson that I just read to you is a lesson that actually has been on my mind for years. I constantly think about this, about Paul at Athens, about how we are like Paul was. Paul had come from a Jewish community, from a Jewish world basically, and, and anytime he would go to places, he would go to a synagogue first, because you can start with Bible references. Here's what Moses says. Here's what the prophet Isaiah says, and draw the lines to Jesus. But now he doesn't have that to fall back on. Now he's in Athens. Athens has a very different system, religiously and culturally, and there is not knowledge of the Old Testament, and there are what he would see as pagan and, and crazy things going on religiously, all around and temples all over from which he could easily see from where he was standing in front of the Areopagus and all the statues and, and all of these things. And, and here's the thing I want you to notice about Paul. He does not go on a rant. He does not go out there and condemn everything he sees as being wrong and pagan and worthless. It's not where he goes. What does Paul do? When he finds himself on square one, he looks for common ground. Now granted, the common ground he has to find is fairly broad. There's really not a whole lot of specific things he can connect to. He says, well, you know, um, we all can agree that there's something, which is basically where he starts. The God in whom we live and move and have our being even some of your own poets, and he quotes a Greek poet. We are all his offspring. Starting with the very, very simple assumption that life came from somewhere. Very general. And then he builds. And then he builds. He doesn't condemn, but he starts with what he has and what they have in common. He says, you know, I'm walking around, I'm taking this all in, I'm very carefully paying a lot of attention to all of the temples and all the, uh, the idols and all the statues and all the stuff you have going on, and I, I noticed something kind of curious. I saw a, a, an altar that said on it, to an unknown God, and there's his hook. Let me help you fill in that gap, because I know who that unknown one is. And from there, he gets specific. And from there, he tells them about Jesus. He talks about God in the flesh, about Jesus dying and coming back to life. Now, he loses some people, it said in the lesson. Some people scoffed and went away. Oh, we're done. That's just ridiculous. And you're going to have that when you start at square one. And other people said, why don't we talk about this later? I'll, I'm open to hearing more. And that you're going to have at square one. And other people were immediately on board. He went back for those who were wanted to hear more and told them more. We are, in another sense, kind of back at square one. We are now, at this point, about two months into the quarantine for the COVID-19 crisis of 2020. We're at the point where some states are starting to loosen restrictions. Uh, institutions of all kinds, including congregations, are making plans for what it will look like to kind of come back when the crisis uh, lifts. It doesn't look like it's going to be just the instantaneous everything the way it was, but we're going to have to kind of ease into and see what the new normal is because we're back at square one. There's a lot of concern at this point about school kids who have been off for two months. Uh, they have several weeks, some cases a month left in their regularly scheduled school year, which they're doing online and through different distance learning programs. But then coming into the summer, that would have been three months off anyways. How much backsliding? How much makeup is going to be? How much damage is it going to be? How much are we going to lose? Businesses. How much are we going to lose? We're in Pittsburgh, and I recently heard a prediction 
a worst case scenario, but that as many as 40% of Pittsburgh restaurants may not survive the quarantine crisis. And businesses of all kinds are looking at this. And we're looking at national debt and every country in the world is looking at job losses and where are we gonna be? And how far back are we gonna go? And churches are looking at this. What's it going to be like? Are people going to even want to come back? If they're used to Zoom meetings and, 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 and YouTube videos and Facebook Live and different kinds of, of worshiping, sitting there in your stocking feet on your couch, are they want, going to want to come back? All this worry, where are we sliding back to? We're sliding back to square one, maybe. But I want you to remember something. Christianity literally started in a hole in the ground. Twice, actually, when God came to us in Christ as a baby, we think that he was in some nice little tidy barn. Almost guaranteed, he's in he was born in a natural cave that existed outside of Bethlehem, and in those caves, people would stable their animals. So if he was where animals were being stabled, he was in a hole in the ground. And then, when he was buried, where do you bury people? Christianity starts in a hole in the ground. God comes to the very, very nothing upon nothing. And from there, builds everything. The hope of the world, God incarnate, lay buried and dead. Jesus was a corpse. But Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Christianity is all about starting over. That's our thing. So really, why are we worried about, oh, we're going to start from square one? Thank God, square one is what we're made for. That's what we're supposed to do. It's not scary. It's the gospel. We start at the very beginning. From death, there is life. From a hole in the ground, there is the presence of God. From, from life comes out of death, hope comes out of despair, everything comes out of nothing. Like so many of us now, I travel almost exclusively by GPS. When people try to tell me where they live, and they'll say, well, you know where this is, and then you're here's this road, and you go and you turn left. Don't tell me that. I don't want to know that anymore. I used to have the little shorthand, you know, and I'll have written directions and have them next to me on the car seat. I haven't done that for years. None of us have done that for years. Don't tell me how to get there. Tell me your address. The computer will tell me how to get there. You put it in the GPS. And GPS doesn't care where you were. If you stop in the middle, uh, or if you make a wrong turn, it doesn't say, well, you need to go back to where you were. Where are you now? And where are you going? That's all it cares about. Where are you? And where's your destination? If where we are is square one, we do not need to worry. Well, you know, we used to be a lot. We used to have more influence and we used to have more people and we used to, used to, it's not the gospel. Where are we now and where are we going? As we plan to return from the quarantine as the people of God, this is the question we need to ask. Where are we now? What does the world look like now? What are the needs now? We are here to proclaim the gospel, not to the world as it ought to be, not to people who should be better. Jesus doesn't die for ideal you. Jesus died for real you and for the real world and for the real them, not the way that we think they ought to be or that we imagine they used to be. It's all like GPS. Where are you? Where are you going? I'm not one for big 
corny acronyms. I don't really like it, but this one I can't pass up. GPS, go, proclaim, show. Go, even if for now it means just go electronically. Go and proclaim Jesus, the hope of Jesus, the one who died, the one who rose, the one who starts from nothing and makes everything. The one who takes you when you're nothing and makes you everything. And then show that. Show that by the way you treat your neighbor, by the way you act in the world, by the way you love as God has first loved you. Show that hope and that new beginning. God is the God of always new. God is the God of starting over. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah.